Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I often, in, on these occasions, say it's a pleasure to be here, but it doesn't seem to be quite the right note today. But let me just say that I, um, I'm uh, grateful to have been invited from the other side of the world to talk to you. Um, I want to address two questions today. Uh, the first one is this, what is a safety case regime? And the second one is how can safety case regimes be improved? Now, uh, you may say to yourself, well, this first topic is entirely redundant in this particular context. But there is another audience um, in which this is a highly relevant question. And that is uh, in the US. It's a highly crucial question as to what really is a safety case regime. The Presidential Commission following the Macondo accident recommended that a safety case be regime be introduced into uh, US uh, offshore waters following the Macondo, ac Macondo accident. Um, but unfortunately, and, and they specifically suggested it be modelled on, on the UK uh, regime amongst others. But unfortunately, very little headway has been made in, in that context uh, for a couple of reasons. One is there's a general inertia uh, around these issues. There are a lot of vested interests uh, with an interest in the status quo, which makes it difficult to uh, move rapidly. And the second factor, I think, is there's the widespread misunderstanding about what uh, safety case regimes involve. Um, and there's a widespread feeling that it, it amounts to deregulation. And one can understand that if you, thought, if you think of safety case as simply a, a matter of deregulation, then you will be wary about uh, this, this idea. So there is a lot of misunderstanding around uh, what just a safety case regime means. Now, I, I'm obviously not an expert. I'm not a regulator. But we have, a, we have various safety case regimes operating in Australia. And I've been familiar with them for a long time. And I speak against against that background. And I have had some involvement, um, quite a considerable involvement, with US authorities in trying to recommend the introduction of safety case regimes in that country. Uh, I spoke in Washington uh, at the request of the US Chemical Safety Board, the Accident Investigation Agency, about the nature of safety case uh, to, I have to say, a somewhat skeptical audience. And I spoke again at the invitation of the uh, US Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, uh, last year in, in Houston. It was an interesting uh, um, environment. They had a group of five different regula regulators who had some kind of interest or connection with a safety case um, possibilities. And they got them all together to consider uh, a way forward. So I spoke at that as well. And so in, in speaking to those, uh, to those audiences, it made me really pause and reflect on what is the essence of a safety case regime and how, will I, how would I present that to an audience which is unfamiliar with these ideas. And that's what I want to do today, to present to you that thinking, because I'm hoping that it will give you some perhaps slightly different perspective on the most significant aspects of safety case. I'm going to identify five features of a uh, I will, roughly speaking, call it a mature safety case regime. What are these five features? And I'll take you through them, make some comments about them. First one, and we've heard a lot about this today, is that it uh, involves a risk or a, a hazard management framework rather than a prescriptive rule-based framework. And strange as it may seem, that is actually the least controversial element of the safety case regime within the US. And the reason it's the least controversial is because it already exists. It already exists. Uh, onshore, um, we have had uh, the process safety management standard, which is a standard made under OSHA, uh, in operation since 1992. And it, the heart of the process safety management standard is a process hazard analysis, which is very similar to the kind of analysis that you need to do under a safety case regime. So interestingly, um, they've got it onshore already in that, in that respect. Offshore, prior to Macondo, that was not the case. Offshore, prior to Macondo, it was a purely uh, prescriptive regime. Since Macondo, uh, things have changed. One of the first things that happened after Macondo was the, uh, the authorities, the regulator, introduced a safety and environmental management system uh, 
uh, in t uh, as a requirement for offshore operators that they should all have a SEMS, as it's called. And again, the interesting thing is that the heart of the SEMS system is a hazard analysis, which is very similar to the process hazard analysis uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the PSM standard. Uh, and so what, I'm, what I've concluded then is that both onshore and offshore, the US has this first element, the very first element, of a safety case regime. The second element, okay, glad it's back on the screen, is workforce involvement. And this is widely recognised, and we've heard a lot about this today, and it's, uh, uh, rightly so, widely recognised as a very important element of a mature uh, safety case regime. Uh, we hear complaints frequently from unions that the, it's not working as well as it should, but certainly there is recognition um, on all sides that the input of employees is really vital to the um, successful operation of a safety case regime. Interestingly, the US process safety management standard also requires, and has required for a long time, employees to be consulted. So there, the, at least onshore, we have that element within the US as well. Uh, offshore, the situation is a little different. SEMS is actually, that's the Safety Environmental Management System, it's been introduced, uh, version one first of all, and later we had version two. Version one was simply a restatement of the API standard 754, which had a safety management, which was essentially, sorry, API 75, which was essentially a safety management system requirement. And what happened was that the regulators simply adopted API 75 as a uh, standard required by the regulator, no longer a, a voluntary standard by API, but now a standard required by the regulator. Uh, that was the easiest way that they could, uh, they could move quickly in, in this appropriate direction. Uh, it's very off, there are very often observations made in the US that these API standards are weaker than the kinds of standards that come out of, um, which are constructed by governments. And this is an example of that because uh, there was no requirement in uh, that particular standard for workforce involvement. So SEMS 1 did not have a requirement for uh, workforce involvement. Fortunately, in SEMS 2, that has been rectified. So uh, the second version of this uh, standard now, required by the regulator, has a requirement for employee participation or workforce involvement. So uh, even in relation to this second uh, uh, crucial element of safety case, it is, more, it is accepted now within, uh, within the US. And there are certain, obviously, limitations on how well this functions, but in principle, uh, the, uh, it is there. The third element um, that I want to stress is this requirement to make the case to the regulator. And we've heard this uh, before, it's been stressed in, by previous speakers. And this is where the US system falls short of a mature safety case regime. The safety case is a case. People often say, why is it called a case? Well, it's a case because it's an argument you make to the regulator saying this is how we intend to, to manage safety and, and most importantly process safety. And it's a case you make, an argument you make, and the regulator has to sit in judgment on it and say, okay, we think uh, you've made out your case, or no, you haven't uh, made out your case, uh, go back and, and reconsider. So ultimately, the regulator must accept or, or reject the case. So in some, sense, in, in, a, in some sense, it is a licensing regime. This is the way safety case uh, regimes operate in most uh, environments I'm aware of. This is not true in the US. They do not have to make this case to a regulator. They, they're required to go through that process hazard analysis, but they do not have to present it to a regulator. Um, and the, the, the concerns of regulators is that if they were sitting in judgment on a safety case, somehow they would then become liable when uh, companies uh, uh, did the wrong thing and there were major accidents. Now, I know the experience in this, in this country is that when something goes wrong, it's not because the safety case as accepted by the regulator was itself deficient. It's usually because people were not in compliance with their own safety case. But for whatever reason, um, it seems in this country and in Australia, regulators are not really uh, concerned about um, being liable should something uh, go wrong. Uh, 
Uh, but that is a concern in the US, um, and it's one of the reasons that they don't want to um, pass judgment on, on safety cases. One of the, if you like, one of the theoretical reasons why they don't want to uh, pass judgment on safety cases. So that's, uh, I think, a, a, the first really significant difference between the systems as they operate in the US um, and elsewhere. The fourth, and I think this is probably one of the most important, they're all important of course, but this, this one is extremely important, that you must have a regulator which, has a, which is competent, well-resourced, engaged, independent. I want to say a few words about each of those uh, adjectives. They're all of them important. Uh, unless you have a really powerful regulator which can be characterised by these adjectives, then it's not going to, it's not going to work. Um, this is very, a very clear message that comes through from Judith Hackett's presentation, and it's, uh, I think, something which is, which is well understood in this country. But it's, it's a mistake that is made in many jurisdictions that they think that the... And it was made in Australia when we first introduced safety case ideas uh, in, in Australia in the 1980s on shore, um, that all you need to do to introduce a safety case regime is legislate for um, the operator requirements that you um, carry out those hazard analysis processes and put in place a system of controls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those obligations that are placed upon the, on the operator, uh, end of story. There was no recognition and no requirement that that safety case be presented to, uh, to a regulator and that the regulator pass judgment on that safety case. Um, and so the assumption was somehow you could move to a safety case regime just by enacting new legislation. That was all that was necessary. No additional resources, no additional regulatory response. It's just a matter of changing legislation, as you would understand, um, a serious error, a serious error. And safety case regimes which are introduced in that way will almost inevitably fail uh, if, there is, if there isn't a regulator uh, with, those, with those characteristics. This uh, has been, I think, tragically illustrated by the report on the crash of the Nimrod in Afghanistan in 2006, which we've heard about already today. Uh, we'll hear about it uh, tomorrow. I didn't realise it was quite such a well-known story in the UK, but it's a story um, which, from which we can learn. This, the Air Force had prepared a safety case on the Nimrod, but it was, as we heard, as Lord Cullen said, totally inadequate. Um, and the point I want to make is that it was not presented to an external regulator which was going to scrutinise it carefully and pass judgement upon it. In fact, it was approved without scrutiny um, at what was called a customer acceptance conference. And those words, I think, are absolutely key. Uh, it was approved at a customer acceptance conference. It wasn't scrutinised by a regulator. And as we heard, the inquiry excoriated the safety case as a lamentable job from start to finish, uh, and those responsible displayed incompetence, complacency, and, and cynicism. And I think the message that comes from that is that a safety case is not worth the paper it's written on unless they go this next step and present it to a regulator for evaluation um, and scrutiny. It's interesting that this particular case, the Nimrod case, is known about in the US as well. And it is used as an example of why safety case regulations will be inadequate and will fail, because they simply draw the conclusion, here was a safety case regime which was a dismal failure, end of story, therefore we should not be contemplating introducing safety case in the United States. Now, yes, it was a dismal failure, but it, wasn't, it was only uh, one, or, one of the principles uh, of safety case which failed in that, in that matter. It was the lack of a independent scrutiny by a competent regulator. I don't think that case um, uh, demonstrates the failure of the whole regime or the whole system. What it does is demonstrate the importance of items three and four, which are on the screen, the undoubted importance of those, of those, of those items. One of the roles of the regulator in a safety case regime is to audit against the safety case. This is, I think, an important aspect of it, which obviously means testing whether the controls are in place, the controls specified in the safety case, testing whether people are, understand the significance of those controls, testing for their knowledge and understanding. So this is not a prescriptive, not just a prescriptive uh, tick and flick exercise. It's a much more um, thoughtful process that's required. 
And this, I think, in turn highlights the need for a competent and well-resourced regulator, those first two adjectives uh, in that list. This audit function um, of the regulator, I don't think, is, is not accepted yet, is not accepted in the uh, US. Let me read to you um, a report of some comments made by the director of the US offshore regulator who was essentially rejecting the notion of audit and, and justifying what might be called light touch regulation when it comes to auditing. And he stressed that the lack of government audits of the new safety environmental management system, this, this lack of auditing of the system is by design to keep companies focused on their own safety. He says, we will do very few audits ourselves. If the industry is relying on government, they're not going to be engaged in this thing. They're just not going to, uh, they're just going to potentially let the government do the management. The last thing we want to do is manage these companies, the director added. We want to see them manage themselves. Now, in a sense, that's, that's admirable. But by pulling back in that way, he's removing that very vital function, I think, of the, uh, of, the, of the regulator in checking on to what extent these people really are doing what it is they're supposed to be doing. So his vision of the regulator then is one which is not an engaged regulator. This is not a, a regulator which is deeply engaged with the activities of, uh, of these operators in an ongoing, uh, in an ongoing way. The last adjective in that list, let me stress, independent. Uh, it's really important that regulators be independent of, of uh, government pressures. And in particular, it's really independent that regulators be independent of departments, whose, one of whose functions is to, is to um, uh, support the industry and one of whose functions is to draw revenue from the industry. And this was a very clear recommendation coming from the, the Cullen Report uh, that we need to separate the safety regulator from the uh, industry promotion regulator. Um, and we find this same issue comes up again over and over again around the world, that those two regulators or regulatory functions are combined within the same regulator. It was the case in the Gulf of Mexico. Those two things were combined within the same regulator to the detriment of the safety regulator because certainly the, in, the revenue generating function or purpose of the regulator was paramount in that situation. There has been some separation of that uh, in the US since Macondo for offshore regulation, but it remains within the same department. And so I think uh, legitimate questions can be asked about the independence of the safety regulator uh, in that context. So that notion of independence, of full independence, which you learnt in this country many years ago, uh, has not been fully appreciated uh, in the US either. I think, um, and then fi the final element in this story, I think, is the notion of the general duty of care imposed on operators. Most, in most uh, safety case regimes, they are, su are supported by a, an umbrella requirement that operators reduce risk as low as reasonably practicable. And I think people familiar with safety case regimes often forget just how significant a requirement this is. Let me just say, make a couple of comments about why I think it's so, so significant. First of all, it means it provides the leverage at all times for regulators to be able to nudge standards higher if they seek to do so. They don't have to wait until there's been some change in the, over in the architecture of the legislation or the content of the legislation. They can simply question whether the existing way of doing things is, uh, reduces risks as low as reasonably practicable. And in that way, they can nudge standards progressively higher. And I understand from my reading that this is why the fire protection standards are higher on rigs in, the U in UK waters than they are in US waters because the regulators have been able to nudge people in that direction in a way that could not happen uh, in the US. Secondly, it makes it easier to prosecute in situations like Macondo. Now we know that the, the public is going to demand some kind of prosecution in a situation like Macondo. Uh, and the regulator in Macondo's situation did not contemplate prosecuting uh, BP for, for those failures. It did cite them for some regulatory violations, but it didn't really focus on a prosecution for, for what had happened. 
In place of that, we get the US criminal, just, the criminal justice system stepping into the breach and the Department of Justice then takes on this role of prosecutor in this situation and uh, engages in clumsy and misdirected prosecutions. One of the, one of the really tragic things about what, ha what has happened in, in the US is that the Department of Justice is prosecuting the two, two of the well site leaders on the rig. These are low level management, uh, I mean these are basically foremen in the, in the terms of the, the role that they performed but the Department of Justice has seen fit to focus on these two individuals as the only individuals it is going to prosecute for criminal negligence amongst all the other individuals which it could have singled out. And that seems to me to show a complete lack of understanding of what is, what is, what is going on and what the causes of these accidents are. And um, I say in my experience, safety case regulators who are able to prosecute would never make that mistake. They would never, never focus at that level. Uh, and then thirdly, I think um, it forces operators to go beyond uh, mere compliance. And this is always the, the challenge. We always, there are rules we need to comply with, standards we need to comply with, but that is not enough. We've got to go beyond that. We have to maintain an awareness of risk. We have to be constantly asking ourselves, have we really reduced risk as, as low as reasonably practicable? And I think it is that overarching duty which means that um, a safety case regime goes beyond the mere prescriptive uh, and becomes a, re a requirement to think in a more constructive way about have we done everything we possibly can. Um, so I think it's um, interesting that um, in, the, in the US there is no general duty of care. Um, there is no general duty to reduce risks as low as pre reasonably practicable. There are some other general duties, but they don't operate in the same way. The most relevant general duty is a general duty to comply with regulations. A general duty to comply with regulations. And so if an operator is under that duty to comply with regulations, the question arises as to what is the regulation I must comply with. And so there are endless disputes in the US OSHA finds itself involved in endless disputes with companies about precisely what it is that the regulations require and don't require. And that is, that is almost inevitable given the uh, architecture of their legislation where the overarching duty is to comply with relevant uh, regulations. If the overarching duty is to re reduce risk as low as reasonably practicable, then at the end of the day it becomes irrelevant precisely what the um, the, the details of the prescriptive rules are. The question is, have you done everything that's reasonably practicable? And if not, then the, operate, then the, the uh, regulator can begin to push you uh, in the appropriate direction. And I, I suspect that this is probably one of the biggest obstacles to reducing an effect, uh, introducing an effective safety case regime in the US, is to set up this overarching framework to get away from the prescriptive mentality towards the, the ALARP uh, mentality. So in summary, I think there are those five independent, um, uh, sorry, interdependent uh, elements of the, uh, of the safety case regime, which, which I think it's important to understand if you are seeking to explain these, these kinds of things to, to other audiences, in particular the US audience. And there's little point in trying to introduce them one at a, one at a time. I'm, I get asked this question, which of these is the one we should, we should aim to introduce first? And my argument is, uh, this system won't work unless you see it as a package. You need to introduce them uh, as a package. The US has uh, items one and two, arguably, uh, already in place, but items three, four, and five, or features three, four, and five on that list are, are lacking. There are some uh, very serious impediments to moving in this direction uh, in the US. One of them is that uh, new regulations of any sort in the US have to pass the judgment of the Presidential Office of Management and Budget, uh, which is, um, implies, which imposes some pretty strict cost-benefit analysis processes on all new regulations. And as you know, it's very hard to do to use cost-benefit analysis to justify regulation in the case of rare and catastrophic events. But those, um, the Office of Bu Budget and Management then uh, tends to stand in the way of this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, legislative proposal. And the other thing that stands in the way is the, uh, and I, I want to say this because it, I think it has to be said, that the US political system is paralysed, making it really difficult to get anything through, through Congress. 
And when I, when I reflect on this and the difference that, uh, between the US system and the, the UK Westminster system, which we have in Australia, where if a government makes up its mind to enact something and it has a majority in the legislature, it can do so and it can, it can introduce a consistent, coherent kind of package. It's very difficult to do that in the US. So these are some of the practical um, problems that stand in the way. So I want to move to the second um, topic then of my, of my talk, which is improving the effectiveness of, of safety case regimes post in the light of Macondo and other big accidents such as the Texas City accident about which we've heard. I think what interests me is that these recent accident analyses, particularly the t in the case of Texas City, the analysis done by the uh, US Chemical Safety Board, identified organisational factors as the root causes. Now, there are, of course, there is no single root cause and the very concept of a root cause is itself debatable as to what that means. But if you let me just use this term root cause for the time being, um, they identify organisational factors as amongst the most significant root causes um, of, um, of, these, of these accidents. And the two accidents I'm most familiar with are Macondo and Texas City. So what I want to do is explore um, how some of this, the insights arising, arising out of um, those accident analyses might be incorporated into uh, safety case regimes, into the activities of safety case regulators. Well, the first one is to do with organisational design. Now, as you know, BP was a highly uh, centralised organisation until the year 2000, after which it decentralised in a very radical way. Functional lines were weak, if not absent altogether, and in particular, engineering lines were, were largely absent uh, in, that, in that context. Um, and so it was that the engineer, engineers working on the Macondo rig or delivering engineering services to the Macondo rig were answerable to the well site leader of the Macondo rig and they were not answerable anywhere else within that organisation. Their activities were not being scrutinised uh, anywhere else within the organisation. That situation has changed dramatically, as our next speaker will tell us about. But at the time, um, that was the case. Organization, uh, engineers were, had no independence from the commercial pressures which were being imposed on them by the, by the line managers, by the line managers within, within the organisation. Um, within BP now, there is a, this very powerful safety and operational risk function which answers to the CEO. So they have really learned that lesson in a very, uh, I think, very profound way uh, about the way in which organisational design can contribute to accidents and conversely, how changing our organisational design can reduce the risks thereof. Now, it's very hard to specify what might be the, op the optimal organisational design. So it's, it's impossible to think about creating regulations about, um, about the appropriate uh, organisational design. But in my view, safety case regulators should be thinking about these things and they should be challenging, this is the word the regulators use, they should be challenging the operator to demonstrate that its uh, organisational structure is one which reduces risks as low as reasonably practicable. That's the challenge which I think uh, regulators should be putting to those companies. And if they come across a company as BP was um, so prior to 2005, particularly prior to Texas City, a highly decentralised, with a highly decentralised organisation, I would argue the prima facie they have, have not reduced. The, this is an organisational structure which does not reduce risks as low as reasonably practicable. And I think, op I think regulators should be challenging operators, particularly in those circumstances, to justify uh, how they think um, their organisational design will deal with these issues. Ultimately, um, as the maturity experience of a regulator builds up in this area, they may end up issuing guidelines about what is the most important, uh, the, the best way to organise yourself to deal with major hazard risks. I don't know about that, but that may be something which might come. But the, the idea of them challenging on that topic is, I think, uh, something we need, to, we need to go there because that's precisely the message which is coming out of accident investigations. The second thing which I think they should be looking at is incentive arrangements. These are all in organisational rather than technical factors. Um, at Texas City and at Macondo, the incentive structures drove ferocious attempts uh, 
to reduce, uh, uh, reduce costs. They also drove ferocious attempts to reduce injury rates, which is a desirable thing. Um, but there was no, um, the incentive systems did not focus on process safety. And at Texas City, there was absolutely nothing in the incentive arrangements to encourage managers to focus on process safety. Likewise, at Macondo, there was nothing in the, in the performance agreements or in the, in the incentive arrangements for managers to focus on well safety. So the, the challenge here is, think, is to identify relevant indicators. And if you are going to have a bonus arrangement which uh, in, focuses on safety, to include those sorts of indicators in some way into your bonus arrangements. Um, this was recommended in the reports following Texas City, both the Baker panel and the US Chemical Safety Board made this recommendation. And uh, that many companies are now trying to do this. They're struggling with the issue of how can we best, uh, what kind of indicators can we best use to indicate how well we are managing process safety? Um, and can we use those indicators to include them within, uh, in, include them within bonus arrangements? The one which many companies have settled on is loss of containment as an indicator. I haven't got time to talk about that now. That's a very good start, but it is uh, by no means the whole story. But what I am wanting to suggest is that regulators should be challenging companies around these issues. What indicators are you using? And particularly, what indicators are, have you included in your bonus arrangements? And what kind of behavior uh, are your bonus uh, structures driving? Um, the third one here is the reporting of bad news. Um, let me go back to Brian Appleton, who was mentioned earlier um, as one of the assessors in Piper Alpha. In that famous video, which most of you will have seen, he has some very uh, profound words, I think. He says, there is always news on safety. Some of it will be bad, will be bad news, continuous good news. You worry. Very, I think, very profound words. So um, organizations which are serious about safety need to find ways to encourage the reporting of bad news, need to find ways to ensure that that which is known at the grassroots of the organization, which it usually is, uh, um, is projected up the organization to people who can act responsibly, responsibly on it. Let me just give you two very brief examples that I saw in action recently when I was visiting a a senior manager in a company, and she had just received a report uh, from a subordinate which was full of good news. And I, she got on the phone to this guy and said, thank you very much for this report. The, the good news is wonderful, but where is the bad news? Please rewrite your, your report to include the bad news. That kind of uh, message coming from senior managers is a very powerful uh, message. This same manager, uh, had a system of rewards, financial rewards, and they were provided to individuals who provided particularly important pieces of bad news and, and moved it up the line. And again, when I was visiting, there was an individual a process, um, a, um, a rel relatively low-level operator who had um, seen that the, uh, the limits of a compressor, operating limits of, com of a compressor, had been changed without going through the necessary management of change process. And he wrote an email to his boss uh, pointing this out, and that boss passed that email up the line two or three levels and finally got to the person I was speaking to. And she was so impressed that she made a $1,000 reward to this person for uh, ensuring that this bad news was moved up the line in that way. So these are just two little stories about uh, ways in which you might set about encouraging the reporting of bad news. So my challenge to regulators is that they should be challenging operators to demonstrate how they are encouraging the reporting of bad news. That's what I would like to see going on within a safety case regime. Fourth one here is that ongoing learning from incidents um, is, is vital. Most safety management systems require that internal incidents be investigated and learned from, but routinely we find that they are not. Uh, the Texas City accident began with the overfilling of a distillation column. Uh, this had happened many times before. I, maybe it was, I can't remember, but a number of times previously this had happened that there'd been an overflow of uh, heavier than air hydrocarbons which had got to earth, got to ground, uh, created a vapor cloud, set off gas alarms, very serious, fire brigade being called, but no explosion. Uh, so these were events that they might have learned from but hadn't learned from. There was just no learning from those events. 
or to go back to Macondo, the drilling company Transocean had an event in the North Sea just four months prior to Macondo. They, um, they had drilled a well, they'd finished drilling the well. They had fermented the bottom of the well, um, just as happened at Macondo. They carried out a negative pressure test of the well, just as happened at Macondo. They then stopped monitoring the well, just as happened at Macondo. Uh, and because they and then the well blew out, and because they were not monitoring, they didn't didn't see it com coming. Fortunately, the blowout preventer worked on that occasion. So this was a, a this was a blowout, a very serious event. Um, unfortunately, Transocean in the Gulf of Mexico had not learned from that event, wasn't even aware of that event, um, and was able to replicate the same failure in in a very detailed way that I've just described. So what I'm arguing is that safety case regulators should take it upon themselves to challenge and ask these companies, how are you learning from these other events, both within your own organisation and, uh, and externally? It's not enough to circulate bulletins about lessons learned. We must show how those lessons have been implemented. Many organisations claim that they are learning organisations, so what this, the challenge here is to demonstrate that you are and my challenge to the regulator is that we should be trying to uh, question them about how on earth they are learning from these, these other incidents. And then finally, the, uh, I think one of the striking failures, one of the striking findings of many major accident inquiries is that um, operators have failed to incorporate lessons of, of previous well-known accidents into their safety cases and have failed to respond adequately to those previous uh, major accident lessons. At Texas City, for example, they had failed to learn the lessons from the, the Exxon uh, Longford accident in Melbourne several years earlier. There are good reasons why they should have. Uh, in fact, material from the Longford accident was circulated around within, within uh, Texas City. They should have learned those lessons, implemented those lessons. They didn't do so. They also didn't implement the lessons from their own accident at Grangemouth here in Scotland five years earlier. So it seems to me that safety case regulators could, could ask um, operators who are submitting a safety case to demonstrate how they have learnt the lessons from those previous very high profile events, how they've inc incorporated those lessons into, uh, into their safety cases. One company I'm aware of, has, um, I think, has got a very interesting strategy, which I'll just mention before I finish, and that this is their way of learning from those earlier accidents. They have a series of what they call process safety basic requirements, PSBRs. So a set of, if you like, um, um, key lessons relevant to process safety, rather analogous to the life-saving lessons which tend to be focused on, on personal safety. So they've got these 12 process safety basic requirements, and each of them is linked to a particular well-known accident. Uh, so they've got a process safety basic requirement on permit to work, which obviously is linked to Piper Alpha, and that, that link is made explicit. They've got a requirement on alarm management, which is linked to the Longford accident uh, at, uh, in Melbourne. Again, um, uh, that was one of the contributing factors to that accident. They've got a management standard on the siting of portable buildings, which for those of you who know about Texas City know that that was really the, one of the key factors in Texas City. So what they've done is they've said, we have all these standards and they represent the wisdom and the learning from these, uh, from these accidents which have uh, occurred in the industry in the past and this is how we are seeking to implement that learning and that people are explicitly trying to make the connections between the standards, the procedures that they have, and the accidents uh, which have generated, which highlight the importance of those standards. And the final step, I think, is to get people to be able to talk about that connection, to be able to tell the stories, so that when you say to anyone in the organisation, permit to work is important, why is it important, they can all tell you about Piper Alpha and the way in which uh, Piper Alpha was initiated by failure in the permit to work system. So I guess to reiterate, um, in conclusion, what I'm saying here is that a lot of the recent accident investigations are identifying these kinds of organisational causes as, as, as root causes, things which we must get right. Um, and um, I'm sure that uh, re regulators are moving in this direction, but I would like to give them prod 
to see them ask in a more systematic way about the extent to which uh, companies are, are um, doing the right thing in relation to these factors. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.